Good morning, everybody. I think the first thing I want to do, by the way, I am Kay Unger, and I think my foot is a great example of business and creativity. <laughs> the business of medicine and the way that my grandchildren decorated it. Anyway, um, I want all of you who are on the creative side of business to stand up. Are none of you creatives? Let's Fabulous. Okay, so I think I kind of wanted to see. You're about half and half. Great. Now what I want to do, now that we know that, I want to introduce my fabulous panelists, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what we're going to speak about. Right here we have Thelma. Thelma Golden is the current director and chief curator of the Studio Museum in Harlem. She has served as a cur curator of the Whitney Museum of Art and has been an extremely influential figure in the art world, supporting many emerging artists, which of course I totally appreciate being an emerging artist my whole life. Interestingly, Thelma started her curatorial career at the Studio Museum and then went to the Whitney for 10 years, only to return to where she started. So we'll like to hear about that. Thelma is affiliated with Bard College and the Colorado Think Tank the, and the Aspen Institute. Wonderful place. Thelma is a sought-after curator across the globe, traveling to all parts of the world, curating as she goes. Her ongoing support has led to a commissioning program for the Whitney's Branch Museum at Altria and introduce the next generation of artists in the world. Welcome, Thelma. And now let me tell you a little bit about Samantha. Luckily, I'm glad you're here. We were worried you were going to be late. A wonderful actress. So Samantha Mathis. Samantha Mathis earned respect and popularity for her work in such 90s films as Pump Up the Volume, Little Women, and John Woo's Broken Arrow, a native of Brooklyn, where she was born, we won't say when unless you want me to. She's very young. She was born in 1970. I actually wasn't born in Brooklyn, though. I don't know why. That's, That's always in my bio. My father lived in Brooklyn growing up, but I was born in Manhattan. Okay. And then I'm, yes. <laughs> so Samantha grew up and surrounded by show business. Thanks her mother for her first job, really. She made prof her professional debut alongside her mother in a TV commercial for baby products and had her first speaking role as Merlin Olson's daughter in a short-lived 1988 TV series, Aaron's Way. It was with her first on-screen starting role in the seminal 90s high school insurrection drama, Pump Up the Buy-In, that Mathis first earned recognition. Following the film's success, she began appearing in lead roles in mainstream and independent films alike. She retreated somewhat from the limelight during the mid-90s, which I'm dying to hear about, but resurfaced in John Woo's commercially successful Broken Arrow in 1996. In 2000, she could be seen as the mistress of a yuppie serial killer, Christian Bale, in Mary Heron's controversial and long-awaited American Psycho. Sounds very exciting. So just for a few minutes, I want to talk about what we're going to talk about. Just, um, it's really business and creativity, which is such an incredible challenge. I think I'm a perfect example of that. One, I've never been a moderator before, so I hope you'll help me along, and I know my guests will. But being a creative and living through the business side of what I've done is, is just so, it's so challenging to all of us. And I think what I want to say to all of you today, what you might learn, and I really want you to do this, is even if, that's why I wanted to see the different sides of the audience, even if you're a CEO and a financial director of a company, I want you to tap into your creative side because creativity can be formed in any way. It's not just people like me who are artists and designers. And what these women will tell you today is the combination. And let me tell you from experience that business and creativity is like Republicans and Democrats or oil and water. 
it is very, very difficult to make them gel and mix. And I myself, after 45 years of running three of my own companies uh, in July, sold my shares of my company, and I am reinventing myself. I now run a foundation and do not-for-profit almost fully as my career, as well as my art. And so I'm here to learn, like you are, about how to reinvent and how to do the mix. So Thelma, basically, let's start out with what has been your path in your career that mixes these two, the business and creativity? Well, I knew I wanted to work in a museum from the time I was a teenager. Growing up here in New York City, I had the amazing advantage of spending time in museums, both formally if through school, but also informally, because I lived here, and this is a city filled with amazing, amazing museums. And I didn't imagine at that time, I didn't have the context that allowed me to understand that that was actually a job, that one could work in a museum, that you could be a curator or a museum director or the many other roles that people have in museums. When I got to college and realized that, it really for me actually made me realize that I could combine the creativity and the business. So that is the thing that brought me so much joy, what was really fueling my passion, the experience of art, could also be my job. Now, I run a nonprofit museum in New York City in this very exciting, complicated economic time. So in order to do that requires an incredible amount of creativity. Right? To I can be imagine. in the space of trying to present for audiences in Harlem and throughout the city the work of artists of African descent to create education programs for our school community, to create experiences for families and visitors and seniors and tourists all require a level of creativity to get it done with limited resources, but endless amounts of ambition and possibility. And Samantha, I'm gonna ask you the same question. Tell us your path uh, in the most sort of organic way of how you got to where you are and what are some of the decisions you had to make along the way. Um, well, my path has been uh, varied. Um, I, I was very blessed in entering uh, uh, show business in that um, my mother and my grandmother were both actresses. So it was um, in some ways very organically easy for me to become an actress. Um, I had uh, enough gumption and, and, and belief in myself and no sense of the stakes and, and how daunting the business was that at 16 I sort of threw myself into it and never doubted that I could get work and so I did. Once I got a little bit older I realized what the stakes were and it became a little bit harder. <laughs> um, but uh, it's been varied and it's been really interesting in the last uh, several years. Uh, I just moved to New York City about five years ago uh, or just under five years, and uh, I came here because I wanted to be more involved in theater. Um, not m perhaps the most um, economically sound decision to move to New York, which is much more expensive than Los Angeles, and to be in the theater, but creatively um, has been a really um, fruitful uh, decision for me and I moved here and ended up getting a Broadway show as soon as I got here and that was one of the reasons I really wanted to be here was to be in the theater and 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 access that part of my um, my career and expand that part of my career so Thelma I, I just want to ask you how have you learned to balance creativity and business, for example, you know, creativity, it's hard to harness it. And how do you balance and make the decisions of when to let the creativity go further and yet still make a profit? How do you mix the two and make those decisions? Well, I run a nonprofit. So start there. There's still, <laughs> I consider it right. maybe not profitability, exactly. but revenue. Right, being sustainable. Oh, right, how, how we're sustainable. 100%. No, and that's exactly right. Um, I think that the creativity always has to be there, right? Because being economically sustainable means being impactful, it means being relevant, it means being resourceful. And in order to do that, and to do that well, one has to be really creative. So I look at creative as sort of a spirit, something that has to be in the process all the time, 
to help make the, how you, the decisions you make in a business sense be informed from the right place. So it isn't so much a balance to me as it is about how to use both tools simultaneously to get to the goal. And just let me ask one more question at this time, and then Samantha, absolutely mm -hmm. pipe in any time. Can you give an example to our audience of the hardest decision you might have had to make trying to choose between revenue flow and creativity, or has that not happened mm -hmm. to you? Um, no, of course, it, <laughs> it has. Every uh, day? <laughs> well, I think it's just a question, you know, the Studio Museum was founded in 1968, and at the time we were founded, and our mission is to present the work of artists of African descent, locally, nationally, and internationally. When we were founded, black artists were not being shown in museums in a wide way around this country. They had yet to be written into the art history. They were not yet fully acknowledged for the breadth and depth of their contribution to American art history. So the museum's original premise was a radical one with a real goal in mind. We still exist in that, though we live now in a moment where black artists work is really defining the space of contemporary art. But so there are many times that we make decisions at the Studio Museum, for example, to do an exhibition of an artist that perhaps no one has heard of. But we know that their place in history needs to be written and therefore make the decision to do that in the absence of perhaps the knowledge of what this might bring, but knowing that our history has always shown that when we take that position, that we have been significant in changing the way in which black artists are represented. So it's really more about making decisions that further the mission and using that to create a sense of institutional integrity, which then creates for us the support the revenue for what we do. Now, Samantha, yes. I'm sure, at least I want to know this, as an artist yes. and an act, actor, I think they say now, how have you managed to balance your creativity and still, quite honestly, make a living? Well, it is a, it is a balance that must be struck. And um, w uh, I would say that I'm, I'm very happy that the landscape of being an actor has really changed from when I first started in that when I first started it, it was you were either a television actor or you were a film actor it was very sort of definitive and the landscape of the world has changed I think in every um, aspect of of business in that you know there it's much more complicated to make a living in every aspect of being an artist and so um, what's wonderful about that as an actor is that there isn't a stigma about being television or film or theater and you can sort of move more freely and so that's what I ha I do <laughs> in order to strike that balance um, uh, you know one of the many things that I've uh, started to do over the last several years is to get into the voiceover world. Um, and, and that has been Explain a really- Explain that because I think if you well, don't know, voiceover is extremely profitable. Well, it can be extremely profitable. Um, and so right now I'm one of the voices of Verizon. And um, it's a, a fantastic thing to do. Um, You're not the voice that we get when we call to complain. <laughs> no, no, it's a, it's a new campaign that they have called Share Everything, and I'm the voice of Share Everything. And uh, I, I love doing uh, this work, and I also get to go, go to work in my sweatpants, so that's really fun. And the antithesis of what I normally do as an actor, having to be on camera, so it's nice to be in a more casual And what would you way. say, Samantha, mm -hmm to all these women out here, this new guard who are coming up and either f really blazing a new trail, what one thing, if there is one, might you um, want to tell them that is, has been just one crazy thing, not necessarily, you know, just something really special that you might want to tell them that they might want to think about as they're moving on in their career in this new world? Well, gosh. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I would say uh, my grandmother was an actress, and she gave me, uh, framed uh, uh, a, a small part of a wonderful poem called If um, by Kipling. And uh, the quote that she gave me as I embarked on my career as an actress was, if you can treat both triumph and disaster in the eye, 
and meet those two imposters just the same. Yours is the world and everything in it. And uh, particularly as an actress, dealing with reviews um, and knowing that you'll get both the good and the bad, you have to just look at them both the same and treat them as non-important and stay the course creatively. When That's you say fantastic. that, you, you, I'm sure you've had that experience mm -hmm. p mounting shows. Exactly. That some are reviewed exactly. well, others are not, exactly. but you know that there's a reason you're doing them, and yes. How to handle rejection. Exactly. How yes. to handle failure. Mm -hmm. Do you have an example of that, Thelma? Um, I think the example I have is that early in my career, um, people often underestimated my potential or possibility. And I realized early on that that could be the thing that would stop me, right? Other people's sense of the lack of possibility for who I thought I might be. But what I realized uh, was that actually that could be for me the greatest gift, right? That their sense of lack of possibility for me opened up a whole space for me to invent my own path. And that was a real gift. And I think one of the things um, I might pipe up here and tell a little bit about myself and my experience is what about failure? And what my father told me, which is not dissimilar from the poem you mean, you never often know the top until you've seen the bottom. Mm -hmm. And you have to pick yourselves up by the bootstrap. And I once had a company that went bankrupt. And two weeks later started the company I just sold. And it's about lack of fear once you've been through it. And I can tell you, if you're honest with people that you meet, I can tell you how many of them have either gone bankrupt or been through a situation. And certainly in acting, rejection, and fashion, you have to be able to, to handle that. And being open to thinking positively is so important at any age, but certainly for the new guard. And um, also, I want to say to you, Samantha, now our young audience, um, how did you start? In, uh, in other words, they might need a guide as to when did you sort of hone in on your passion? And how was it just with your mother? And then maybe what was the first step? Did you get an agent? It's the how-to, I think, they need to know. Uh, well, I as I think I touched on early, earlier, um, I, I did have an exceptionally, I think, easy time in, in, in some ways embarking on my career as an actress because my mother and my grandmother were actors. Now, no one gave me a job, um, but I grew up watching my mother's path, and so I did know sort of the steps that needed to be taken. I knew that I needed to get an agent. Um, my mother had casting director friends who were like, yeah, we'll give your daughter a shot, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, again, going into it at, at 16 where you're brazen and, and sort of <laughs> um, so emboldened uh, and, and belief in yourself, it was very easy for me to sort of ask people to be given these opportunities and I got a job within two months of auditioning and I was on a TV series and I was off to Australia um, doing a, a TV series. So it was very easy for me in some ways. Entering into my 20s, sort of realizing the stakes and um, then needing to make a living, it became a little more complicated. Um, so what uh, was the worst time you had? What was your bottom? <laughs> what was my bottom? Uh, I um, think, if, and you can answer it later, and Thelma can pipe in here and tell yeah. her story, but I think if you think about the bottom, which I just described, so that they can learn how to get up from there. And not everybody sees it, but everybody will come to some challenge. Can you, can you think of that? I, I mean, it, I haven't had one particular bottom, but there's certainly many times in the path of my now 26 year career where I felt like the wind is out of my wings and I'm deflated and I feel rejected and I'm not sure and can I do this? Um, and uh, I think the thing that, that is most important is being willing to fail and, 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 and sort of making friends with that and knowing that that's part of a creative career. Um, and, and by fail, I, um, I just mean being willing to take risks 
It's not always and going, you know, and the best creativity comes from that risk. place. And really saying? being an entrepreneur, if you are one, they say is basically taking a risk. Yeah. Thelma? And I think that's it. And I think we all know for people who are engaged in any creative work, fashion, acting, theater, visual art, not from where I sit, but artists, that the process is always a risk. It all does not work out. I spend time with artists all the time, and the work that people get to see on the gallery walls is just a fraction of the effort that went into the experimentation to get to those works. So I think it's also about being engaged in the process as fully as you can to get to the end result. But to your question about Bottom, there was a point at which I transitioned from my job at the Whitney, and it was at that point when I had been been made to believe in this idea of the dream job. And in my mind, I had the dream job. It made it impossible for me to imagine that I could have another dream job. How did you make that decision? A whole dream career. And so in that transition moment, as I began to look at positions, I really was unclear that so much of what makes a job amazing is what you put into it. So when offered the opportunity at the Studio Museum, and I took it, within a few months, I realized that yet again, I was having an opportunity to do something that was incredibly special, extremely necessary, and would be, and continues to be 12 years later, incredibly fulfilling. So tell me, both of you, Samantha, for example, when you were growing up, did you have, was your dream to be an actor? It really was. Um, I, I I was entranced with what my mother did, and and then, I mean, as any young person is, you know, you sort of uh, consider a few other careers. I thought I might be a, a fireman um, or a forward for the New York Knicks. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, by the time I was 12, I did a play in school, and I really fell in love with acting and uh, began to beg my mother um, to let me pursue that as a career. And it wasn't until I was 16 that she actually um, succumbed and allowed me to pursue it, but really on my own terms, and and not not that she was unsupportive, but she wanted it to be mine, and she wasn't going to be a TV mom, and she gave me uh, you know a map of Los Angeles and said, go to it, it's your career, go for it, um, and um, so you had yeah. great family support. Yeah. How important is that, Thelma? Did you have that kind of support from your parents? I did. I mean, you know, the primary sort of adolescent rebellion fight I had with my parents, I grew up here in New York City as well, um, a little bit earlier uh, than <laughs> Samantha did. So I grew up in those days where, and I grew up in Queens, right? And when you grow up in anyone here from Queens, you know, you refer to Manhattan as the city, right? As opposed to the five boroughs being the city. And so growing up, my, my, the only thing I wanted to do was the ability to take the subway on my own so I could go to the city um, so that I could go to museums. And at 13, I wanted to do this, and my mother said, absolutely not. And this became our great fight. And finally, my mother succumbed, right, to the idea with all kinds of rules attached, only at this time, and da-da-da, and I had to call when I got there. This is before cell phones, so I had to go to a pay phone and say, I'm here, and all of that. But, pay phone. Yeah, yes. yeah, my age. Pay phone. No, I'm aging myself, right? I, 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 totally I, I, aging I, I, myself. I, I, Remember that? Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Totally Do you, uh, does any of the audience no. know what a payphone is? They don't know is? what that is. It's okay. It's okay. Um, it's okay. But it was at that point that my parents realized. Now, I grew up in a home where my parents were deeply invested in culture. They were supporters of the theater. Um, they were uh, supporters of the Negro Ensemble Company. So I had the chance to see, you know, amazing theater, amazing dance. I, you know, went to Alvin Ailey and Dance Theater of Harlem every season, New York City Ballet. But on my own, I really sought out culture and that's how I knew this is what I want to do. So it sounded like both of you were really supported. Yeah, totally. So um, I myself, starting in my career, my father was an investment banker and did very well and would tell me all these business stories. I had no idea why. And my mom didn't work. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when my father passed away very young and left me a little bit of money, that's how I started my business. But my mom said, you're married, you should stay home, take care of kids, and would not pay for my college. Mm -hmm. So 
that's how I really got started. Mm -hmm. And I think not all of us get that support. And I think it's important for those of you out there to know that whether you are wonderfully supported like mm -hmm. you were or you weren't, you can still do it. And um, I also want to ask one other question, and then maybe we'll throw it out. I want you guys to start thinking about your questions. And that is, I know I feel very strongly about philanthropy and what we do outside of our jobs. I happen to be, which is a perfect mix of business and creativity, I am, on the, I am a trustee of the New School, which is straight line, more business, and I'm also a Board of Governors of Parsons. So I'm a unique combination, mm -hmm. and when they asked me to be a trustee, I said to President Van Zant, are you sure? Mm -hmm. I said, I realize I've run three businesses, but when that spreadsheet comes out, I'm not so great at it, and it's usually printed too small. But anyway, and they said, and he said, as well as the many other people I met, was we need creativity on these very sort of, you know, more strict boards where everybody is from a, a corporation, et cetera. And when you think about it, and I want you all to think about this, think about 3M. They allow people to have free time once a week to be creative, and that's how the Post-it was developed. And mm -hmm. Apple, all these companies now, and even large corporations are looking for board mm -hmm. members who are creative. So if you are on the creative side, really you have to believe in yourself because it's not always so easy. It's a hard job to judge. And then the other thing is because you're really, you run a business, mm -hmm. how do you, encourage your creatives and how do you control them as one of our last questions how do you hone them in because for Samantha somebody else is honing you in I assume mm -hmm. go, go uh, well uh, yes although it is a collaborative art um, be it theater or television or film it is uh, a, a team certainly that comes together to create the character. It's not just my work, um, it's, it's a, a, a costume designer, it's a makeup and hair person, and everyone comes to it with their own specific ideas. I mean, it's, it's not like so it's running many a business, creatives but really it is coming many together. creatives coming together, and um, it is a, a balance to be struck of having your own opinion, but then being open to others and I think that I always benefit when I come into it with a, a, a level of humility and sort of openness of hearing everyone's perspective and bringing that all together is, is, a, is a better way to create a character than just coming in with my own ideas. Uh, and Thelma? I, I don't know how that would translate to business, yeah. but... It is a business. Some, some way all that is working together. Right. Mm. And I, I think it is about it all working together. I think it's about everyone, the creatives and the business side, having amazing communication. But I also would say it is what I began with, that we all, to do what we do and to do it well, we need creativity. I think one of the most creative people on my team is my chief financial officer because she's the one who is listening to these amazing, fantastic, wonderful ideas, but being able to translate and make them happen. So we all play a role in what the final product is. So you brought up two more questions that I'd like to, you to answer, or both of you together, and that is she, the financial mm -hmm. advisor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're not going to speculate if it was he, would he respond that mm -hmm. way. But the she financial advisor, how did you find her? Mm -hmm. And because that's so important for all mm -hmm. of us here is mm -hmm. how do you find those people? What's the best method, mm -hmm. whether it's this organization or others, to find those people? And what did you find in her that made you maybe know that she was a creative financial advisor mm -hmm. in a positive way? There's plenty of creative financial people who steal. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, well, first, I can't take credit for finding her. Her name is Sheila McDaniel, fantastic member of my team, my CFO and deputy director. Um, my predecessor, Lowry Stokes Sims, she found her. How uh, was through referral, through, through an amazing board member, 
of ours Great. who, understanding what we might need, saw in Sheila the kind of skills which, on the one hand, would create the kind of clear sustainability for a nonprofit to create for us the opportunity for growth, but in a very balanced, measured, conservative way, and also allowed on a day to day a management style that would sort of bring all these parts of the museum together. We continue to work together as a team, but what I appreciate from her is her ability as part of the team to really see broadly and widely into the creative space and sort of understand how to create opportunity for us to do the work we do. That sounds fabulous. Mm -hmm. Do you have someone as an actor who helps you with your business side? A fabulous advisor. Is it an agent? As it's you said, it's a village. I mean, it's, it's not a village. Yeah, okay. I mean, I have, an, I have a manager. I have an agent. Um, I have a tremendous acting coach uh, in Los Angeles, who's really been a huge mentor and friend in my life, who um, who has taught me so much um, a, as an actor and uh, has been a wonderful friend and a cheerleader in my life in the moments when I. Um, have lost faith in myself, which are, you know, in a 26-year career, you certainly have those as an artist. Um, yeah, so it's not just me out on my own. I have a team. It's interesting because you brought up the word coach. Mm. There's something quite common or, or quite popular today, and those are business coaches. They're sometimes life coaches, business coaches. I don't know if any of you, your personal, like your acting coach may may become that, but it is something that I have found that um, many, many people use. I'm on many um, organizations of women entrepreneurs, et cetera, and it's something new. I don't know if uh, you have ever experienced it. It sounds like you haven't needed it, but I want the audience to know that this is a great tool. Mm -hmm. It's somebody, it's like a cheap shrink, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I swear, because I they, you pay them a flat fee, and you, they must be well recommended. They can teach you how to speak, because if you cannot communicate, it doesn't matter how great a computer is. And they help you in your business situations, such as what we're discussing today, how to deal with the creativity of business, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Thelma? And I think while I haven't um, had a professional coach, I think that everyone can and must find those people who support mentors. you. I've had great mentors. I've had great sponsors, people who are not just mentoring, but who have literally been able to help me execute the goals that I might have on behalf of my organization. And I think that can happen without seeking out professional help, but, but just engaging in other people in your field who have more experience, other even peers. I mean, exactly. I work with several of my peer museum directors, all of us in the same place, but often our day-to-day -day experiences are so helpful to each other. Because even though you sit sometimes and you think the thing you're going through is only ever happened to you and this is the first time it's happened. No, it's like you, the minute you get on the phone, you realize your peers have a perspective that can help. So I think it's about finding that network around you, your own little tribe of people who are willing to help you along the way. And, and I, I wouldn't you say that it's safe to say that um, when younger people coming up through the ranks ask you mm -hmm. to mentor to mm -hmm. to for your perspective that it's a wonderful thing to be able to oh. share that experience we learn from them actually which brings up i think it would be a great idea yeah. we would love to open yeah. the uh question and answer mm -hmm. section mm -hmm. now so i don't know if there's people walking around with microphones but i'm sure we could probably hear you uh raise your hand or stand up if you have a question Go ahead, right in front. Uh, oh, there's a mic. Oh, come up front if you could. Okay, I'm going to speak loudly. Oh. I was just thinking that They say they can't hear you in the back. We really would love you. It's not a scary mic. I think mic. it's because we're being filmed that they want you on the microphone. <laughs> Here you go. Whoa. Here we go. Oh, thanks. Does that work? Does that work? Hi, how are you? Um, I think both of you, uh, well, all of you have been blessed to have been very focused at a young age as to where you want to direct your creativity. But how do you think you would have um, managed if you, had, if, if you had to reinvent yourself and have sort of gone to plan B and not 
have been able to um, direct your creativity into exactly what you thought it was going to be? Wow, that's a good question. Well, I think, I, I think I'm constantly reinventing myself as an actor. I mean, quite frankly, when I ventured into doing it, I just wanted to be in, in movies. <laughs> um, and, and then, you know, uh, I, I was for a while, but then that, that sort of changed and I started to transition in age and, and um, needed to be open to expanding my horizons. And so I, I'm always reinventing myself in, in, in pursuing other aspects be it voiceover, which is which has been fruitful for me economically, and then also falling in love with theater um, and 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 sort of pursuing that aspect of my career. But I would say, in general, when I watch people struggle with figuring out what they want to be when they grow up, as it were, um, there's no wrong choice. There's no one forever choice, um, and. I think that being willing to pursue a path and then know that that could be your path for 20 years or 10 years and then trying something else. I started a business in my mid-30s. Now, ultimately, I ended up closing it, but I had an idea, um, and it was to make uh, arrangements out of succulent plants, and I did that for four years. Um, ultimately, I ended up closing it, but it was this wonderful sort of side business that I had. Um, n being open to trying different things and, 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 and being willing to fail, again, is, I think, the most important thing. And just being willing to try different things. Selma, and any additional comment? I actually think um, figuring out, and I used to, I learned this at a class I took at Harvard, they say in the Harvard Business School, you have to find out, almost more importantly, what you don't want to do. And that's <laughs> part of reinventing yourself. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Oh, yes, we uh, go ahead. And then we are passing around a uh, microphone. Go ahead. What's your name? I'm Adriana Kurtzer, and I have a question for um, Telma. Uh, it's about contract and salary negotiations in the arts world mm -hmm. as an arts professional. Um, when a woman finds herself in a situation to negotiate within the nonprofit world, um, how do we how do we make how do we position ourselves the best way possible? to break the pattern of the pink ghetto that exists mm -hmm. in the arts world where a lot of senior positions are still held by men and a lot of the work in museums gets done by women, but the salary gap is, is huge. So mm -hmm. uh, for someone who's in the position to negotiate, mm -hmm. how, how that's a great question. Great, Thelma. Well, I think as women, we have to be able to learn how to name all of our skills and to be able to understand those skills within the context of a negotiation. I think often in, in all worlds, but in nonprofits in particular, you know, we all have experienced nonprofit directors who do everything, right? We've all gone to, I mean, you know, in Harlem, I'm around nonprofit directors running small but critical organizations where they truly do every single thing. I think beginning to name those things and being able to understand our very wide skill sets that, say, in the for-profit world would be incredibly valued, and being able to understand that language and placing it on those things we do every day in the nonprofit world are a help to closing the gap and also to valuing what women bring to these positions. That's great. How about a few more questions? We have about five more minutes. Go ahead. Um, I work at a K through 12 school and the founder of Urban Outfitters is on our board and he gave money to create a center for entrepreneurial leadership. So that's what we're developing. And I just wanted to get advice from you guys, um, maybe starting in the ninth grade and in high school, um, what do you think would be good, I mean, how do you feel about entrepreneurship being a course? And then what are good experiences that high school students could have to learn some of the skills that you talked about? I actually think I'm going to answer this one, having been an entrepreneur my whole life. And um, I think it would be a great idea to have a course. I know here at the New School in Parsons, we start teaching kids. We try and do programs where they start to learn earlier about these kinds of things. And I think starting then to also open their eyes to entrepreneurship and also to the fact that when they get their education, that they need to know if they're going to do art and business. They really need to know both sides. I mean, we have a wonderful course called The Business of Fashion, which are the people who are more trending towards the business side. And 
and sort of matching them with creatives. And that might be even a fun tool in that course is to match what you see as a very creative student with perhaps somebody who's more business side or so on and, and do almost like, like they do mock trials, set up little mock situations. And I have had mentors where they were 14, and by the time they were, with, uh, I mean, not mentors, uh, interns, where we had discussions, and I had them writing business plans, which I have never even written, when they were 15 years old. And they can talk about their ideas of how they want to sell a sneaker and do things, and I think it's a fabulous idea. How about another question? Um, I've got a question. Hi, here. Hi. Oh, hi. Uh, Go hi. ahead. My name's Shaiko, um, and I w wanted to ask. Can you speak into the microphone? Is hi. It there. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, my name's Shaiko, and I wanted to ask the actress. Um, basically, you said you've had a career for twenty-six years, and and you just spoke about. Um, did you say twenty-six years? I did. Yeah. I know. I'm just making that face because I can't believe it's been no, that but long. No, that, that's <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you're correct. Um, and you just spoke about starting. There was a time when you started. A business mm. and I just wondered was that a time when you stepped away from acting completely and has there been a time when you have done that as an actress I feel like that's kind of the place that I might be at the moment and it's a very scary time and so I just wondered what was that process like for you there have been many many times I've stepped or at least thought about stepping away from acting it's a very um, inconsistent um, career path and can be incredibly disheartening. Um, I think that when I started that, that business, which was called Succulent, um, uh, I was at a place where I was feeling um, not entirely fulfilled by my career path and I think wanting to sort of take more um, charge of what I do. So much of being an actor is waiting to be asked to the party, as it were. and. Um, and that it is, is unempowered, the opposite of being empowered. And so um, part of starting a business was having an idea um, that I felt passionate about, but it was also about taking charge and sort of creating something for myself. Now, um, ultimately, I did um, close that business. Um, but what I've started to do, and I think is really... Um, so important for anyone entering the entertainment business is to be diversified. And I don't know if you would say the same for any business, but as an actor, I, and when I've been asked to speak to young actors, I would say, don't just act, write, produce, mm -hmm. direct. I, th um, I think, Samantha, I hate to interrupt, but mm. I think that's a great way for us to start to wrap. I'm getting the signs that, you know, the music at the end. And I think that that diversification about trying new things and everything. And I just want to say, for me, Thelma and Samantha, I am excited about what I've learned from you in my new life. Yes. And I just want the audience to know that all of us, you can write to us. Our information will be available. There's so much more these wonderful, empowered women have to tell us. And don't be af afraid to ask. There's an hour break sometime this morning find us. We're pretty easy to see. And thank you so much. I wish we could ask more questions yeah. and so on. And this has been live streamed. And if you miss something, you can contact the new school and possibly get a copy of all the live conversations today and tomorrow. And I know there's some great speakers and I hope you stay for both days. And I know I'm going to try. Thank so you. Thank Kay. you thank all. Thank you, so much, thank you Kay. Kay, for moderating.